Australia today, 30,000 route miles of airlines are in continuous operation and air travel is accepted as part of our everyday life. The safety factor is still, however, a much discussed topic of travellers, probably because, first, they are not aware that on a mileage basis air travel is safer than road travel, and secondly, they have not been fully informed of the efficient organisation, technical skill and scientific endeavour which has and is being applied to ensure freedom from mishaps. Operational value is the paramount consideration in the design of aircraft for the Royal Australian Air Force, but the safety of the air crew is provided for to the maximum possible extent. Enormous loads are imposed on the wings by violent manoeuvres, and adequate strength is ensured by careful design and the most searching tests, so that accidents such as this shall not happen. To investigate problems associated with aircraft and to prevent such accidents, the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research has established the Division of Aeronautics at Fisherman's Bend, Melbourne. In order to give a clear idea of the methods used in the laboratory for applying test loads to aircraft wings, let us first use this model to demonstrate the method of investigating the strength of wings. The loads in normal flight act upwards on the wing surfaces, but with a large wing it's often more convenient in the laboratory to turn the wing upside down. To support it centrally from the test frame at two points and to apply the loads downwards. Loading frames bearing on specified positions are placed around the wing. To produce the desired loading distribution the frames are connected by a lever system and then by cables to hydraulic loading units bolted to the floor, which is designed to resist the maximum test load. The loading units are worked by oil pressure. The oil being supplied through a common pipeline from a single pumping unit. The pressure, and therefore the load, can easily be controlled by one operator. Now that we have the idea, let us follow in some detail the procedure required for testing an actual wing in the laboratory. At the end of World War II, Australia was producing large numbers of the renowned Mosquito aircraft, and it's fitting that we tell of the testing of the wings of these famous fighter bombers. The wings are tested in a test bay, having a reinforced concrete floor 120 feet in length, and capable of withstanding a uniformly distributed load of 300 tons. However, before the wings are placed in test to determine their strength and confirmation to airworthiness requirements, much preliminary planning must be carried out. A considerable portion of it in the drafting room. The first thing is to consider the design of the wing, then to determine the test loads, and finally to plan the loading system. The laboratory workshops are fully equipped to manufacture the wide range of specialised testing equipment required. A good example of the precision work necessary is the manufacture of the hydraulic loading jacks, the rams of which must be ground to very close tolerances. The jacks are of the packless ram type and the sliding parts must have a very high surface finish to eliminate friction because the actual test loads applied to the wing are determined by measuring the oil pressure in the hydraulic system. Meanwhile, the wing has been prepared for testing. It is turned upside down, this position being a convenient one in that the simulated air loads may be applied downwards by the loading units attached to the test floor. In interpreting the following sequence, the inverted position must be borne in mind. As part of the planned method to obtain correct load distribution between the fuselage and wing, 
a dummy fuselage is attached. The tank bay covers are part of the stress structure and are carefully screwed into position. While still on trestles, the loading stations are marked out in accordance with the loading plan. After as much work as convenient has been carried out with the wing at ground level, it is hoisted up and moved into the test position. This wing is one of a series of mosquito wings being tested, and therefore the lower sections of the loading frames, by means of which the loads will be applied, are already in approximate position above the hydraulic jacks. Great care is taken to ensure that no damage is done to the wing. This is particularly important because the mosquito wing derives much of its strength from the outer skin of plywood. There is a double skin on the compression surface, and a single skin on the tension surface. To the centre section of the wing, steel structures are attached representing the front and rear fuselage sections. As mentioned earlier, these dummy structures are necessary to ensure the correct loading conditions at the wing fuselage joints. The front and rear sections are connected by steel cross members and the whole structure suspended from a rigid test frame by two start links, one at the front and one at the rear. The wing and its dummy fuselage are therefore free to roll about a central cordwise axis. In order to represent the engine loads, it is necessary to apply loads to the engine mounts. These loads are approximately opposite in direction to the air loads. Therefore, in the inverted test position, the engine loads must be applied upwards. The engine mounting is connected by a ball and socket joint with a stout steel column. The column transmits the upward load from a bank of five hydraulic jacks. On the previously marked positions, pivoted loading blocks covered with thick felt are placed along the wing, one set on the front spar and one set on the rear spar. On these blocks, the loading frames will rest. The frames for applying the air loads are now placed in the approximately correct positions along the span of both port and starboard sides. The frames may be put on singly or, if the wing under test is one of a series of the same type of wing, in a group, which is more convenient and saves considerable time. The lower part of each loading frame is then raised and attached to the opposite member. These lower sections are not in direct contact with the wing, but transmit the load to the upper frames by front and rear connections. The testing equipment applies loads to these lower beams by a lever system. The position of the lever connecting links is carefully adjusted to obtain a correct test load distribution from frame to frame. The load is applied to the lever system by flexible steel cables connected to hydraulic jacks some of which we saw being manufactured in the workshops. The jacks are actuated by oil supplied by pumps capable of delivering at pressures as high as 3,000 pounds per square inch. The loading units are bolted to the specially constructed test floor. As the wing supports over its span the weight of the test rig, as well as the superimposed load, the rig is weighed and the required allowance is made. It is usually necessary then to add weights to parts of the rig so that the rig weight everywhere will be a uniform percentage of the design ultimate test load. Deflections of the wing during the test are measured by fine steel wires attached at desired positions along both front and rear spars. The wires pass around pulleys clamped to the floor and then over a deflection measuring scale attached to an indicator board. One board being at each wing tip. In this way, deflection of the wing during the test can be measured quickly and accurately.
As the wing is suspended at only two points, it will, if the loading is slightly asymmetrical, tend to roll to the most highly loaded side. It is therefore necessary to take measurements at the center of the wing of the amount of roll in order to make corrections to the deflection readings. A final check-up is now made of the equipment. The loading frames and their positions are examined, as are the hydraulic jacks and associated cables and levers. The pumping units and all the other many parts of the equipment. Slings are attached to the overhead electric hoists in order to catch the fractured wing section when ultimate failure occurs. The wing is now ready for test. The first phase of the test is to apply a proof test load. The oil pumps are started and the load maintainer valve opened. The load maintainer controls the supply of oil at constant pressure to the two outer jacks which apply a balancing load to each engine mount. Sufficient balancing pressure is now applied to all the loading jacks to take up the slack in the rig. The jacks are so weighted that all float at the same pressure. Unlike the outer engine jacks, which exert a constant force throughout the test, the inner engine jacks apply the varying test load on the engine mounts. The pump operator calls for all the recording equipment to be set at zero. And he sets his oil pressure gauge at 50 pounds per square inch, which is the calibrated pressure at which the jacks float. The zero readings of the dial indicators at the wing center are recorded. The wing deflection indicators are also set at zero. The first loading is to be 25% of the design ultimate load. The load is gradually applied in planned increments. At the previously directed levels in the loading, the pump operator holds the hydraulic pressure constant, calls the loading, in this case 25%, and directs that all deflection readings be recorded. The deflection markers give a direct reading of the deflection of the wing at specified positions along its whole length. The dial indicators at the wing center record any slight roll of the wing to either side. To check that the hydraulic system and levers are transmitting the calculated load, proving loops and also strain gauge links have been incorporated. After all readings have been noted, the load is increased in set stages until the load has been built up to the test proof load. The test proof load, which is arbitrarily selected and specified by the airworthiness authority, must be applied for at least one minute, during and after which the wing must remain in an airworthy condition. All the mosquito wings used in these particular investigations were proof loaded to 90% of the ultimate design load. Having withstood the first proof loading, the wing is now subjected to repeated loadings to 90%. All pumps are switched on. Failure might occur from fatigue or if the wing does not fail under a specified number of loadings, its ultimate static strength may have been influenced. Repeated load testing is in its infancy. The staff of the Division of Aeronautics being the first to carry out such work on large aircraft structures. In this particular case, the peak load of each cycle is over 50 tons. No small load to be applied and released up to six times per minute. The repeated load control permits the load to cycle between any desired limits. A counter records the number of cycles. The wing has now withstood 5,000 repeated loadings without any apparent damage. The final test, the determination of the ultimate strength of the wing, necessitates testing to destruction.
the load is to be applied in scaled increments up to 90% of the design ultimate load and then gradually increased until ultimate failure occurs. This crucial test of the wing strength is witnessed by representatives of the organisation for whom the test is being carried out, in this case the Royal Australian Air Force, and by the senior officers of the Division of Aeronautics. At 90%, to which point the wing has previously been proof loaded, the pump operator directs the recorders to make readings. Then to remove the dial gauges from the centre of the wing and finally to stand clear. The load will now be gradually increased until failure occurs. The loading has increased to 100% of design ultimate load. From previous experience, it's considered the failure will be in this area. The failure is typical of this type of wing. The ultimate strength of the wing was in excess of the designed ultimate load and represented a force of approximately nine times gravity acting on a fully loaded mosquito aircraft weighing over eight tons. Upon removal of the loading frames, the collapsed wing is more clearly revealed. As part of the complete record of the test, the various failures are photographed and some of these photographs used to illustrate reports. To investigate the cause of failure, it's necessary to cut the wing up for thorough examination. Material test coupons are also removed and from these the laboratory workshops prepare test specimens. In the Materials Strength Testing Laboratory, these test specimens are examined to determine the basic strength properties of the material built into the wing. Routine specification tests are made of impact strength or toughness. Tensile strength is also an important characteristic. As is strength in compression. With wooden constructions, the moisture content of the specimens is an important factor. Besides all these routine tests, the laboratory is well equipped for the numerous non-standard tests often required in research work. Finally, having obtained all the test results, it is necessary to analyse them and prepare a report. This report covers the wing tested but similar reports are issued covering the numerous applied and fundamental problems associated with the aircraft industry and carried out by the division. The design of faster and more efficient aircraft and the safety and comfort of all who travel by air are dependent to a considerable extent upon aeronautical research and the wide field of general scientific research being carried out in Australian and other laboratories throughout the world.